welcome to The Last ND, a board gaming podcast brought to you from two exciting countries across Europe. I'm your host Alessio and uh, I'm joined here today by Cara. Hello! And uh, that's all, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, two people episode, does it feel cozy? We want to be cozy. I feel cozy. Yeah, sit back and relax. So... Uh, today we will talk about uh, a game about delays, I think. And I will tell us about this game, so let's keep it as a mystery for now. And then we'll talk about another sports game for um, possibly a minor sports, I don't know, because uh, continents have their own testes, so I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> we'll start with the standy catch-up. And we'll start with... Uh, mm, let me see. Uh, you know, th- th- this is... This is difficult because I, I don't want to pick offend me, anyone me, by going me. first and last. So let's be Kara. <laughs> How do you do? Yes. Um, hi, yeah, I'm um, I'm doing okay. I, it's really stressful That's for me. That's good. Yeah, it's really stressful for me right now because I'm fighting German bureaucracy, which is the best kind of bureaucracy. Um, and I'm really happy that I'm saying this word and don't have to write the word because every time I have to write bureaucracy, I have to look at how it's written in English. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I've written because it a lot. In German is, hmm? how do you say bureaucracy in German? Bureaucratie. Yeah, it's the same. We say bureaucrazia in Italian, so it's the same. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, I think really the, the, the English word bureau is just, it, it's written so weird. Um, anyway, so, um, yeah, because of my uh, move to a different state, which is very complicated when you're a tenured teacher serving the state in, in Germany. Um, so, but um, um, I'm mildly hopeful that we found a solution and that it will work, which I hopefully will find out in the next couple of weeks. Or maybe yeah, they. It has a lot. It has a lot to do with forms. So yes, forms, forms, forms. Yeah. Yeah. You got those stamps right. <laughs> yeah. And also the online platform where I had to 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 apply. Um, I had to register and I used some random password and it said it's not valid. So I checked and they have a very long list on <laughs> things the password has to adhere to. <laughs> Uh, like minimum length, maximum length, uh, several characters that have to be in there. The, you may not use three characters in the row that are the same. And it's... <laughs> yeah, now now, now let, let me say one thing. Let, let me rant a bit because uh, we, we don't have actually anything else to do today. So <laughs> uh, password complexity, it's stupid because you just want a long password. Do you yes. think that a, a, a computer trying to brute force a password would just uh, uh, take more time just because your password is X, Y, Z, H, H, underscore, uh, <laughs> hash and something with 11 characters or is something cool like laser dinosaurs riding birds? <laughs> if you have a, a password like that, the computer will take ages to decode and you will remember that password. Come yes. on! Yes, actually, my favorite password once was uh, 52 characters. It was just a sentence, a whole sentence. I could easily remember it. And I hate it when places limit the length of a password, like this one. And Yeah, um, we, we shouldn't talk about passwords online, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, the weirdest criterion for a password on this pa- page is... It may not start with an exclamation mark or a question mark. <laughs> it may okay. contain them, but they may not start with it. Okay, it's a problem in their software. <laughs> they have something weird happening down there, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, so anyway, that's uh, German bureaucracy for you. Um, even the passwords <laughs> need to be complicated, uh, complicated yeah. to create. The password can be very easy, but it has to be complicated to create. That's that's the thing. Yeah, you must learn that password. Yeah. Apart from that, I um, I don't get around to playing a lot um, currently. But um, right now, I'm playing um, Artisans of Splendor and Vale, which I very likely will cover in the next episode. Um, mm. And so far, I am really enjoying it. 
Um, heard good things about it, yes. Yeah, and um, it's particularly interesting because it's a two to four player game, and when you play it, you notice, yes, yes, it is meant for two to four players and everyone controlling one character, and I'm playing it solo and control all four characters, <laughs> which it works. I can understand when people don't play. like it. Yeah. <laughs> More will come in the next episode. <laughs> yeah, of course. Cara reviews, woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> so, what about you, Alessio? Well, uh, this is this is difficult because people will hear it a long time after I talked about me, but I just talked about me yesterday, basically, <laughs> when we recorded <laughs> the other episode. So, so I, what I happened really in the last 24 hours? Not even 24 yeah, hours, like uh, oh, 20 hours. Oh, okay, uh, if I were wise, uh, I would probably should have reserved uh, some things to say today. And this is a good thing. I think I'll note it down for next episode, maybe. But uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Any nice dreams say? last night? Or yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, no, nothing. It, it, it hasn't happened a lot since the last episode. I think uh, this is completely true. <laughs> so uh, not a lot. I uh, I didn't have the time to play a board game in, the, in that time span so uh, i'm mostly following uh, kickstarter campaigns that uh, that i can say for instance there's and there should still be in the last few days or possibly the pledge manager just opened the mind bug but battle fruits uh, campaign which is the third installment of mind bug uh, you know, I, I like a lot of Mindbug, uh, that hasn't changed, possibly the base set uh, is a very great, very, very good card game for two people, uh, you get used to it, so you want more cards, so you go the beyond uh, uh, sets, which include new mechanics and stuff, at possibly the cost of complicating a bit what is a beautifully simple game. And now you have Battle Fruits. The theme is uh, fruits uh, genetically engineered for war. So it's beautiful because you have uh, this kind... Uh, uh, you know, the community gets to do a lot during a Mindbug campaign, so you you play against uh, staff, uh, you play against the designers, uh, you have tournaments on the online app, uh, you, you can get to choose powers or names of the cards. And there is this card with a small fig on a UFO, and uh, they are trying now to give it uh, a name, of course, uh, the, there is a community contest, uh, someone says Fig Newton, which is, of course, uh, very banal. Uh, I think the best name I saw was Sci Fig. I definitely wanted that. Genius. And that's basically it. Uh, we are. Uh, there is not a lot of other crowdfunding campaign I'm following, actually. So I'll oh. probably be. Yeah. Regarding crowdfunding, um, I talked about it on. Um... Sorry for interrupting you. I talked about it on the. I talked about on the Discord, but I can also share it here. Um, something happened with one campaign that really ah twisted the nerve. Um, <laughs> uh, it's uh, the it's queers the role playing game, which I'm really oh, looking yeah. forward to. I remember that. And yes. um, so they, you know, campaign finished and uh, money was was taken and pledge minister manager started. Everything filled out, address, credit card, everything, and the uh, shipping estimate showed up. And basically, it was like, hey, now you just have to wait until they charge you and send it to you. And then the updates came, so hey, production goes along, and then the update came, hey, we are shipping now, great. And um, and then the update came, so shipping is basically finished, except for those who haven't paid shipping yet. <laughs> and I was confused, because I hadn't gotten anything. And um, Please let me pay. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was this um, um, paragraph in the update uh, that basically said, yeah, there are some people whom we haven't charged yet because of some feature of Becker Kit that they initially planned to use wow. but then didn't use or something. 
and, um, and the future was don't let people pay so they don't get their game maybe maybe, maybe. yeah <laughs> and, they used it yeah <laughs> and so um, those people who hadn't um, paid shipping it should contact them and um, so I contacted them and told them hi huh? and basically they were like okay so if you want a game you have to pay shipping do you want us to collect the shipping and I yes I filled out the pledge manager ages ago so you can collect the shipping why haven't you done it just done it but okay yeah so um, they collected it now and um, I hope and the some... stuff is shipping hmm? is the stuff shipping then um, so far not it's been a week but um, <laughs> I yeah it's um... yeah th there's a lot to love <sighs> Starters. Now, uh, I, I, I really could uh, go on with a few elements of news. Uh, for instance, there's Jamie Stegmaier from Stonemaier Games, who announced Vantage, uh, Vantage or Vantage or whatever, because I don't know how to pronounce that. It's possibly French-ish. I don't know. But uh, it's a kind of uh, roguelike builder uh, which is not campaign based so it could be a cool game and stuff like that but i really won't talk about this now because uh, well you pointed out kickstarter and kickstarter delays uh, even a game which was on time and stuff you managed to get it late exactly that's what happened right yeah yeah, and since we are talking of delays, actually that brings me to mind your game. Because you are talking about a game from the famous uh, novelist writer George R. R. Martin, the king of delays. Oh, yes. It's, uh, yes. the Game of Thrones board game, and this is the best launch of uh, topic ever. <laughs> Yay! So, yeah. Okay. Mickey, it's up to you. Drop pick. <laughs> Yeah, I think we can stop the podcast now. We have reached yeah. the heights that can be reached. Yeah, and, we um, can break the mic and never talk again because nothing more beautiful will ever happen. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, a Game of Thrones, the board game, second edition. Um, it's a... Yeah, a fan favorite, not fan, fan. Fan. Fan's fan. favorite, yeah, our fan. I mean, I personally think it's um, everyone favorite. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever met a person who didn't enjoy the game, um, which doesn't necessarily mean everyone <laughs> likes to play it because time... It's long. <laughs> and, um, yeah, but so... It's from 2011, uh, the second edition. There was a first edition no one cares about. Um, <laughs> um, no, I mean, it was mostly the same game. Second edition streamlined it a little bit and integrated an expansion into the core game already. Um, so, yeah. Um, 2011, three to six player game. It's basically an area control game. Um, in the world of the Song of Ice and Fire, which is the name of the series, you know, of the book series, not Game of yeah. Thrones. Game of Thrones is the title of the TV show. Yeah, the the, the <coughs> book series, the one which will uh, not uh, continue with Winds of Winter, of course. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, uh, uh, I think that Patrick Rothfuss announced the Doors of Stone for November of this year, so possibly it's the end of the world or something like that uh, Patrick Rothfuss is another author very late okay yeah. so um, anyway public service announcement yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually important to, to point this out because it doesn't have the show license I don't know right now from when the show is uh, maybe it actually aired after it, 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 uh, time has lost meaning yeah. since COVID um, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, so it doesn't have the show license, so the characters in the game don't look like you will probably expect them to look if you haven't played the game yet or, um, <laughs> you know, lived under a rock. And, and drone. And, um, yeah, so, um, air control game. You have the map of Westeros in front of you. Um, 
the players each control one of the great houses. Um, I'm trying to um, remember them from mind. It's uh, House Winterfell, House... Um, no, Stark. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, it's yeah. a bad start, bad start. Um, Lannister, Baratheon, uh, Greyjoy, Martell. Um, who else do we have? Tyrell is in there. Yeah, the, the, what, what, what's Tyrell. that six? Uh, Tyrell, Martell, Baratheon. Yeah, I think that was six. So those yeah. are the, the houses you um, control, um, though you don't have. Um, options when you play with less than six players. Basically, um, if you play with three players, it's limited to Stark, Baratheon, and Lannister. Yeah? And um, so each player count has an appropriate number or, uh, or a matching the, number of houses is, that are exactly. available, um, which has to do with the starting locations. Of course, they are not random or anything. Um, they have their um, basically home fortress castle um, where they start and um, when you take houses away randomly um, things can get really skewed so um, yeah so if you play with less than six players um, you introduce like neutral armies that cover up part of the board and either make it so you have to conquer them if you want to control them or that you can't even enter them. So basically they just block off parts of the game board. Um, the game is played over a series of rounds. At the most 10 rounds. Um, after 10 rounds it's over and you uh, check who's in the lead and this person wins. If someone manages to conquer or control at any time during the game seven castles um, they win immediately. And oh, the Seven Kingdoms. Okay, I see. <clears throat> and um, But if no one manages this and you reach the end of the 10th round, you just check who controls the most and this person wins. Um, each round has three phases. You start with a restaurant phase, which is skipped in the first round, where um, you draw basically event cards um, that um, influence how the round is played. For example, um, armies are re represented by meeples on the board. You have your normal foot soldiers, you have your knights, you have uh, siege engines on the land and you have ships on the sea. And um, if you have multiple units in one um, province, it's considered as one army. And depending on your supply situation, you can have different amounts of armies. So if you have very low supply, maybe you only can have one army that ha consists of three units. Um, supply is increased by controlling provinces that have the supply symbol, um, but just conquering such a province doesn't increase your supply. You have to wait until the event pops up that adjusts supply according to how it's right now. Yeah? So um, that's an example of how these event cards work. Um, other things might be, hey, this turn everyone can recruit new units. Uh, you can't regularly recruit, you have to wait for this event. And um, also in this phase on these event cards, there might be a uh, symbol of basically a, a, um, a, a skull of a mammoth, um, which is the wildlings symbol and this, which advances a marker for the wildlings and if that reaches the end of the track, they attack yeah? and everyone has to come together to defend the attack. Um, <clears throat> which I can just come to now. So if the wildlings attack, which is kind of interesting, the whole game is about fighting each other, but there are a lot of elements where you have to think about how much you want to antagonize other people and how much you want to help other people in this certain situation. One of them is the wildling attack. Um, basically, um, wildlings have a certain strength depending on how far along the track they were. There is an event, hey, wildlings attack. If that happens before they reach the end, they are not as strong. And every player has influence markers they can collect during the game. and 
when wildlings attack, you check, okay, what's their strength? And then everyone has to secretly decide how many markers they want to put in. Everyone reveals at the same time. And if you match or exceed the number of the strength of wildlings, you defeated the wildlings. If the players defeat the wildlings, the player who bet the most influence gets a bonus. Everyone else just doesn't get anything. If the players don't defeat the wildlings, everyone gets some negative effect. And okay, the one who like bet Katan, the... uh, with Citizen Knights, yeah. yeah. And the player who bet the least gets a, like a more negative effect. Huh? Like, I don't know, hey, you have to destroy one unit for everyone, and the one who bet the least has to destroy you, two units, for example. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So um, it's uh, kind of interesting. It can, can lead to very interesting situations when you just sit there and think, okay, how many influence, pro influence does everyone have? Yeah? And um, <clears throat> do I have a chance to actually be the one who bets the most. Okay, I can't be, I, I, there, there, there's a likely chance that I won't be the one who bets the most. So the decision for me now is, do I bet anything? Uh, if I don't bet anything, chances are we will all lose. But if I don't bet anything, ah, I will lose more than the others. So it's 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 really kind of, kind of interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting decision space. Yeah, um, it it can take quite a bit of time for, for everyone to decide how much they want to bet there. And, um, <laughs> And also, of course, if uh, you see, hey, uh, I have two influence available and everyone else has more than I, so why should I bet? Either they make it without me or I will be the one who bets the least. But then someone else might think, hey, they know they can't win, so maybe they just save their two influence um, and bet <laughs> <Yeah>. nothing. So, <clears throat> and yeah, it's... Um, it's kind of it's it's really uh yeah it's uh it's an unnerving game of nerves yeah. yeah and that's only you know the first phase and one part of the first phase which ha doesn't have happen every round after you handle these uh, event cards uh, comes the planning phase um everyone plays at the same time um and you place a an order marker into each province you control um, and um, well if each province you control where you also have a unit um, <clears throat> order marker there are five different ones a marching order a defending order a supporting order a raiding order and a um, I only have the German version Machtzuwachs uh, basically uh, an order to increase your power, your, your influence. And wow. um, <clears throat> they are placed hidden on the board. At the same time, everyone can just say, ah, where do I want to do what order? Um, basically, um, marching order lets you move units. And if you move your units into a province where enemy units are, you would um, start, a co uh, start combat. Defense orders increase your defensive value in the province where you give this order. Uh, support orders allow the units in this province to support fi uh, combat in an adjacent province. Um, raiding orders allow you to remove uh, supporting orders, raiding orders and the influence growth orders in adjacent provinces. And the influence growth uh, orders just give you these influence markers, basically. Each of the orders also has a, a, a star version, the, the specialized version, um, which generally just makes it better um, in case of uh, the raiding orders. The raiding order with the star allows you to remove uh, a defense order from adjacent province, as well as uh, others. And the increased uh, or, or better influence increasing order um, allows you to recruit in this province which is the only way out of the event to recruit new units now um, you place your orders hidden once everyone has placed all their orders um, <clears throat> you um, reveal all orders 
And um, then comes the action phase. The action phase um, is, in, in the action phase, you basically do all the order in a certain certain order. <laughs> um, you start with all <laughs> the, the orders in order. Yeah. Uh, can't be, you can't be, you know, can't, just can't do orders willy nilly. You have to do them in order. Um, you start with the raiding orders. Yeah? So in turn order, everyone does one raiding order. If they don't have any, they, are sk they uh, skip uh, or they pass until all raiding orders have been done, yeah? which also means you can counter raid. So if you know I'm, it's my turn before with my enemy, and I know he will likely try to rate this supporting order I'm putting here. So I'm placing a rating order. And when it's my turn, I rate his rating order. So my supporting order doesn't get rated. Yeah? So um, mm -hmm. placing orders is a complicated thing. Um, the game has a weight of 3.73 on BoardGameGeek, by the way. So, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so after the um, rating orders, the marching orders um, are done. Um, so again, in turn order, everyone does a marching order until all have been resolved and all um, um, resulting combats have been resolved. Um, and then you do the influence increasing orders. The, the consolidate power, I think it's called. I'm reading that from the sounds, Wikipedia page. That yeah. sounds <laughs> my, like it makes sense, yes. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, yeah. Um, Combat is um, mostly deterministic. Um, each unit has a certain strength. Foot soldiers have a strength of one. Knights have a strength of two. Um, siege engines have a strength of four. If you attack a province which, have, which has a castle, in all other cases, they have a strength of zero. And um, <laughs> so you basically, um, when you start a combat, each adjacent province with a supporting order can decide do they want to support the combat and whom do they want to support. So if two other players are fighting and you have a control an adjacent province with some units and a supporting order, you can decide to help one of those two. Yeah? So uh, again, a lot of wow. diplomacy involved with, uh, you know, during the whole planning phase, like, hey, I would really like to conquer this. So if you would place a supporting order here, you could help me and in turn, I could, you know, leave you alone over there or something like that. Yeah? And um, yeah, so, so you can betray someone by just not issue, issuing a support yes, order. Yeah, because the beautiful. orders are placed hidden. So you have to trust them that they are actually doing what they promised to do during the planning phase. And even then, even if they placed a supporting order, until you actually do the combat and they say, yes, I support you, they can still change their mind. They can say, no, I'm not doing anything. Or they can even say, no, nah, you know what? I'm supporting your enemy. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so um, you check who is supporting, then you count everything together, and then come the house cards. Each player has seven house cards, which represent um, characters from the house you play. And um, they have a strength on zero to four you have one card with zero strength one card with four strength uh i think two with one two with two and one with three that comes up to seven yes and um so after you calculated how much power each side has everyone chooses one of their house cards secretly and they are both revealed um, at the same time um <clears throat> you um add their strength to the combat, uh, to, to your side's strength. They also might have some special effects like, hey, my house card this says that you have to pick a different one from the one you just played, yeah? something like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then you basically check, okay, who won? Yeah? Um, there is a tiebreaker in the game, uh, which I'll come to in a moment. And um, after you decided who won, um, the losing party has to retreat and you determine losses. Um, generally, you don't lose units. Um, so just by losing a fight, you don't lose 
units necessarily. However, house cards might have swords or towers on them. After you decide who won, you check the winning side for swords and the losing side for towers. And if the winning side has more swords than the losing side has towers, the losing side loses as many units as the winning side has more swords. Yeah, so a tower cancels a okay. sword. And, um, also, you have to retreat in a way that it's legal. So, you know, with the whole supply thing, you can't retreat into a region where you already have an army. If that was in, uh, lead to an army that you can't supply, then you have to destroy units until you can supply it. Also, siege engines can't retreat, so they are destroyed when you lose. Poor siege engines. And yeah, not, not uh, nobody thinks of the siege engines. Yeah. <sighs> Secret heroes. Unsung heroes. It's a plague. Yeah, it's a plague. Um so yeah, and that's the combat and um the house cards you played are discarded until you played all your house cards. So if you have played six house cards, you have one on your hand. If you play that one, you take the other six back on your hands. So after the first combat, you will never have all seven cards on your hands, which is also quite interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's mostly the game. There is one more thing. Um, the whole influence thing has not just a use in uh, the Wildling attacks, but mm -hmm. also there is an event that basically says, hey, now vote for basically your place in the kingdom. And there are three um, tracks you can vote on. Um, I forgot the names and I, again, I have the German names. So um, the first one is the throne itself. Um, this determines the play order or the turn order. Um, so you start, hey, um, everyone gets removed from there and then everyone can bet and whoever bets the most is on place one, whoever bets the least is on the last place and so on. And... Um, Iron Throne, Valyrian Steel Blade, the Messenger yes. Raven, maybe. If you win on this track, and on the first place, you get the Iron Throne Marker. The Iron Throne Marker means you get to decide uh, ties outside of combat. Beautiful. <clears throat> so if you have that, you know in all these betting things, you only have to bet as much as the next person because you can decide that you win the tie. And um, yeah. It also counts when voting on this track. So if you were on the first place, then you vote on this track. Until the voting is completed, you still get to decide the ties. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, then you have basically the military might uh, track, uh, which decides ties in combat. So in a combat, there will, if you are, have the same strength, the one who is further up on this track will win. And whoever is on the first place gets the Valyrian Steel Sword uh, marker, mm -hmm. which they can use once per turn to either um, yeah, well, they, they can use combat. it to give them plus one in a combat. There, yeah. there is, is something else, but that's it. So, and the last is uh, basically the King's Court, um, which decides how many of these star orders, of the improved orders, you may place. Um, so if you're on the, in the first place, you may uh, place three star orders per turn and uh, successively less or even none if you are further down the track. Um, <clears throat> it has a different uh, track if you are playing with four, three or four players. Um, and whoever is on the first place gets the uh, Raven marker, which allows them to uh, exchange an order after all orders have been revealed. Or if they don't want to exchange anything, they can check the top Wildling card to see, hey, what would the next Wildling attack be? And decide if we want to leave it on top or put it 
at the bottom, so which is also pretty powerful. So if Whitelinks attack, they might know if it's worth to vote uh, to to bet a lot to win, or if they say, ah, I can take the negative uh, event. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, this is an additional thing, uh, a lot of time spent deciding, oh my, how much influence do I spend on which track? And um, because when you vote, you vote on all the tracks. So everything gets reset and uh, in order. So whatever you voted, uh, you bet on the first track, you won't have for the next track. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is one more thing. It's an optional module that you can use. Um, basically, if you think combat is too deterministic, um, there are um, battle luck cards. Um, basically, in addition to how combat is normally works, after you calculated everything, every player draws one of these battle luck cards, which give you an additional modifier on your strength. And uh, it can also be a negative modifier and they get added to the mix. So there's always this element of uncertainty in the end. Uh, they also have a, um, some of them also have a skull symbol on them, which means, hey, your opponent loses one unit no matter what. And uh, so they also lead to more lost units, um, basically more mean combat, more random and mean combat, if that's what you like. Yeah, so now I explained in uh, like half an hour, a very complex game. Um, yeah. How it's does very it thematic, yeah. How does it play? How is, is it to play this game? It's amazing. Um, as long as you have a group that's really willing to get into this whole diplomacy thing. A player that's just there and is like, hey, you know, I don't make any deals and whatever. That just sucks, and that's not how this game works. Uh, the whole game is built around this talking to each other, making alliances, breaking them again, backstabbing people. Um, also, I think when you're playing it with like six people, it, it will take a long time. Uh, I think the record <laughs> for me was seven hour game with six people. And which is like t Twilight Imperium times. Yes. So, yeah. And we made one very big mistake. Um, if I ever get enough people around to the table to play <laughs> this game, I would very much look to, to avoid this. We basically eliminated one player after two hours. No, the poor guy. <laughs> and the really mean thing is, technically, there is no player elimination. <laughs> you you basically risk it, him uh, like leaving him without anything to play yes. so he could only take basic actions and pass the, yeah, yeah. They, they, they only can pass at this point because um, basically the, the, the whole idea is you can't destroy one of the great houses you can however conquer all their lands destroy all their armies and take away all their influence they can't do anything at this point, but someone else might ch might step in, free their home uh, province, move back out of it, and then they have a province again they can control. So basically, if someone is like, "Hey, yeah, I, you know, I feel for you, so I free your home province and you can play again." then they ca they can jump back in. So yes, there is technically no player elimination. <laughs> But of course, <laughs> it That's sucks. That's cruel and unusual. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if you play with six players, I highly, highly recommend that you as a group have this understanding not to kind of eliminate someone. Erase yeah? someone from the game. So yeah. if someone is obviously on the ground, don't kick them. <laughs> huh? It will just lead to you having a five player game with one person sitting there and watching you <laughs> so and the, and the, the home owner should uh, just wait five hours for you to complete the game yeah. <laughs> before kicking you out <clears throat> of his home yeah <laughs> um so yeah um apart from that um we i, I bought the game um 
during um, university and I think it's among the five games in my collection I played the most um, because <laughs> we, we played it so often and um, it yeah it's just um, there even now years later um, sometimes someone references something that went on or uh, some comment someone did during one game or oh remember when uh, you we fought about uh, over these two provinces or whatever and uh, it really gets interesting when you have the same group of people you played a lot with and you don't play with these um, battle luck cards because of the pre predeterministic nature of combat at some point we just knew how certain combat uh, fights would turn out so we didn't do them anymore uh, so for example i mostly played house stark and one friend of mine played house Berfian. and for those of you who have a general understanding of uh, the geography of westeros um, they aren't adjacent to each other but the sea regions are pretty close to each other and controlling sea regions is very important because that allows you to ferry troops to further away regions and <clears throat> there was one really important sea region of the, of the coast um, of um, Winterfell and at some point we had just figured out that if we both went all in how Stark would win so we didn't both go, go all in he just left me alone and I moved one ship in there which then again sometimes led to me just moving one <laughs> ship in and he coming with his whole fleet and being like ha uh, <laughs> so um, yeah um, that's that's it's 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 a really fun game um, it does take a lot of time um, so for Could people a lot of frustration because <laughs> there is a high high player interaction yeah um of course there um for for people who like have jobs and and alive it might be hard to get the, the group together and i have to say the game really shines at higher player counts uh, particularly yeah. the way the rules are written that was our experience the four player game sucks um <laughs> because um, as I uh, said at the beginning, um, you have these markers that kind of block off part of the map. Um, in a free player game, you, you basically cut off the, the south of Westeros and it works well. In a four player game, the, most of the south isn't cut off, but only occupied by neutral armies. And the armies standing in um, provinces with castles they aren't an issue because you know siege engines have a strength of four when you attack a province with a castle in it and all these armies have like strength three or four so that you can defeat them with one siege engine and um, we had this very re memorable game when um, the player who played house Baratheon just ignored the three other great houses and just moved south over with his ships and had one siege engine move from castle to castle there conquering them all without anyone opposing him <laughs> and suddenly saying hey i think i just won and everyone being baffled like what <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was this catapult wandering through the desert <laughs> yes so um yeah, we actually house ruled that we we. Blocked. They will fear the catapult. <laughs> we blocked off um, parts of the south in a four-player game as well in the future. Then, and um, so yeah, that's something I'd recommend. You know, keeping an eye out for in four-player games. Um, yeah, there are expansions for the game. I have to admit, I have not played any of the expansions. Um, there are two small ones and a big one. Uh, with the big one, you make it a an up to eight player game, and add the uh, second continent um, to the map. Um, I really like the idea, <laughs> but, but as I said, I it's not credible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I I can't get six people around the table to play the base game. So how the hell am I supposed to get eight people together? Um, so I assuming it would take longer with eight players um 
<clears throat> you you know th- uh, there are twenty years so, twenty year old something who will still play board games, so that's probably for them. Yeah. <laughs> Any, anyway, it was so, two thousand eleven. It was Final Fan. Uh, it was Fantasy Flight Games. So it's basically all the games were like this. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah, for those of you who are you know in university or something like that, and yeah, have a lot and of free are time. Not and for some reason, you are not playing Blood Bowl or Twilight Imperium, <laughs> which is the college games, actually. <laughs> so uh, then you check the game out. I highly recommend it. Um, it's it has yeah, a very special place in my my heart and my collection, definitely. Yeah, I want to just add one thing. Uh, not knowing anything about this game except <laughs> what you and Fan told me in separate occasions. Uh, negotiation in games is usually today the meter of comparison of, of negotiation games are the the PAX uh, games or the the games from Cold War uh, or Verle because it's a German uh, it's a German surname but he is American so don't know uh, but the, the, it's that kind of negotiation where you should actually uh, negotiate a lot to play the game right because if you don't negotiate a lot someone will win immediately and the entire game economy will break and there is this kind of and i understand why they are like they are because uh, it's easy to catch with this kind of negotiation it's uh, easy to have uh, uh, someone take to let someone take the lead to maybe gain advantages in future plays or something like that but uh, there is this old way of negotiating which which is perfectly exemplified by this game uh, which is basically the cutthroat thing the way of negotiation you had in diplomacy games uh, mm-hmm. It's basically backstabbing and negotiating and trusting uh, your life and your entire game on one people, one person, because you will end like in risk when you have just one territory. But in the in, just in case some opponent has to to destroy you, you get basically everyone else uh, uh, fence around you and defend you against everything because you don't need to be destroyed. So yeah. Player elimination is gets a bad rap these days, but I I, I personally have uh, uh, a penchant for this kind of playing negotiation games. So yeah, I like it. Yeah, thumbs mm. up. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, a fan fun anecdote um, regarding this whole uh, player negotiation thing. Um, one of the, um, my friends uh, who played with us all the time, um, at some point we um, met with a bunch of people. We met online through uh, um, um, World of Tanks, uh, you know, our guild there. And um, in the evening they, they got out Risk. And um, <laughs> I wasn't interested, but my friend played with them. And apparently the, these people, people who, who got the game out play Risk a lot, they really love it, and he just stomped them. And um, <laughs> they played two games, and both games he, he won and stomped them, and um, they were like, what the fuck, how is he so good? And he said, well, I've played so much Game of Thrones, I just know how to convince people that it's a bad idea to attack me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's basically, actually, that is kind of the same thing that Fenn said uh, when he recounted an episode of Game of Thrones, so this must be true. Yeah. Anyway, since we talked a lot about Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. uh, it's, now ta- it's now time to uh, talk about another kind of different games, but which ties its bindings with another old college game, in this case Blood Bowl. And I am talking about Trickshot, in this case the second edition by Wolf the Signa Games. Okay, uh, there are a lot of ways to approach this game, let's start with data. Uh, Trickshot is one 
is one game from Wolf the Signa Games, which is a, a small Latvian uh, uh, design game publishing uh, designing company, uh, which does a lot of Kickstarters. Uh, they are known, uh, we didn't cover them a lot, but they did a lot of notable games, uh, and actually I have a couple of friends who uh, routinely buy their games, and I can tell you that are all high quality, even if niche in nature. For instance, uh, the, the, I think the most famous game they published is Guards of Atlantis, he, he, it's got uh, Guards of Atlantis 2, which is an improved uh, uh, revised version, and uh, it got a recent reprint with updates and other stuff. And Guards of Atlantis is, uh, I think, I can say that it is the only one MOBA, like uh, multiplayer online battle arena, like the video games like Dota or League of Legends or stuff. Uh, is the only MOBA game which is actually fun to play. And that's saying a lot. Uh, now, uh, <laughs> it requires... Yeah, it, it, it still requires uh, a full table to be enjoyed, so I, I don't get a lot of chances to play it, so I didn't buy it, and I didn't buy all of the expansions, but uh, they are open for late pledging, and uh, it's a great game if you have five people uh, available to play, five or six. Uh, their uh, their uh, peculiarity as a design house is that their games are extremely streamlined and clean to understand. And this brings me to Trickshot. Okay, Trickshot 2nd Edition is a game about ice hockey. So a game that in Europe uh, I think is ba barely played if it is played at all. And oh, whoa, is, whoa, uh, whoa, yeah. whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you play whoa. a lot of it. Yeah. No, 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 never. But um, yeah. <clears throat> actually, the, the city I um, lived in and uh, made my uh, went to high school, Mannheim, is famous for the ice hockey team. And the town I... Um, the Mannheim Marauders. No, the... Oh, the, oh it's uh, a Western the, name, them. Uh, <laughs> ice Bear. And, uh, ice Bear? Is it Ice Bear? I... Um, Probably, you know, possibly. the, 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 the yeah. white bears <laughs> no. living in, in uh, frozen places. Um, polar bears. Polar bears, yes, the, the polar bears. And the town I'm currently working in um, also is famous for the ice hockey team, and um, it's the Wild Wings. And the uh, our school has a, um, you know, um, sports track um, students can, can choose. And um, a lot of them actually do ice hockey. So, huh? okay. Huh? So, huh? Uh, huh? Uh, excuse me if I live in Italy where there's sun and uh, we can keep uh, temperature yeah. for ice. Never, basically. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, ice hockey, which is a minor sport in Europe. <laughs> uh, one thing, uh, actually, this game uh, remember remembered resembled um, me a lot of of blood bowl which is uh, a game i loved from my college years so uh, i will probably draw draw some comparisons but i want to uh, tell you how it plays because it's super simple basically you have a nice uh, uh, i think it's called the rink uh, the 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 gameplay field uh, of uh, ice hockey and you have the two teams, uh, the red team and the blue team. You get a team card, you can pick or randomly choose, uh, which is associated with the city and the stadium, but uh, it's not really important. It is important because the team card tells you the adjectives of your players. Uh, the players are all the same with... Uh, uh, with with just a difference in uh, size and speed, which is basically the number, uh, which is basically a value you use in fights when you use sides for fighting and you use speed for moving. So uh, the stats depend on their position. 
So if you are a defense, you are big size, for instance, if you have a center, you have very average uh, uh, stats with a bigger with a bigger speed and you can be a wingman with a high speed and low sides and so on. And uh, these are all equal for all the position players and the position player are the same for each team. But the adjectives you get on your team card will tell you, for instance, that, uh, okay, I don't remember, I, I, I kind of remember quick but I don't think it's quick. Uh, I think I Italianized the, the name. But you can have special powers which apply only to your position because you have that objective. And that comes into play to actually make the, the teams asymmetric. You could play a perfect asymmetric game. You could give this to chance. and Or you could pick the exact card you want. Uh, the beautiful thing about this is that uh, you can play an entire strategy based on the team you have. They are polit suggestion to play some way and they reward you if you manage to exploit these advantages which actually do, uh, do a lot in the entire game. Because how the game is played, uh, people familiar with sports games will be familiar with the concept of turnover. Basically, it's your turn, then it's your opponent's turn, and uh, basically your turn ends earlier if you cause a turnover, usually by failing an action you play. In this game, this is super streamlined and simple because you have special dice. These special dice come with an X side, with a red X, which means the action is failed. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, they are six-sided dice, uh, they have two blank faces, which means nothing happens, which is good. They have one arrow face, which modifies uh, usually negatively uh, an action depending on the action you're taking. A puck icon, which modifies usually negatively, but in some cases they are required to complete the action. They also modify the, the action you're taking. And then there is this one red X on the on the die, which means that the action has failed and you caused a turnover. Every team has three stamina tokens, which are basically a free reroll of all non-blank dice they rolled. This means that when you get a red X, you can reroll all dice which did not obtain a blank which means that if you obtain a lot of blanks, you reduce the risk of rerolling bad. Now, how this is important? It is important because the system to make you, to make you have fast-paced turns is genius. You can basically take any number of actions you want in your turn, but for the first action, you use one die. For the second action in your turn, you use two dice, three dice, four dice, and so on until you basically crumble un under the weight of the number of dice mm -hmm. you roll. And uh, this is super cool because, like I said, you have stamina to reroll uh, your actions. So you are pretty safe to do your first action. You are a bit less safe to do the second action and so on. But stamina tokens are not refreshed automatically. They are refreshed only if you, at some point, manage to pass. Meaning that, at some point, you decide, I'm not pushing my luck anymore, I pass. And I refresh my stamina tokens, and it's your turn. Which means that the entire design space and decision space of a team is what is the minimum set of... Uh, what is the minimum position where I could be an advantage for next turn? And this is beautiful because the best game, uh, the king of sports games, which is Blood Bowl for me, has basically this kind of luck mitigation of deciding to push your luck. This mechanism exactly, uh, actually not exactly, is, it's like this, but a bit more complex. So what, uh, what uh, Trickshot does perfectly is to make a game very, very fast. 
while uh, a game of Blood Bowl uh, doesn't last any less than two hours and that is just if you play with the rule of having four minutes turn at, at most otherwise it's a turnover in uh, trick shot the simplest game you can play uh, which consists of just one period is uh, 45 one hour long at tops so for one of games uh, trick shot is superb uh, the game is incredibly fun you can have uh, you, you can basically tactically decide everything and you must decide the most important thing uh, which is to stop uh, is the game is fun it can be played by basically anyone I can manage to play it with my 10 years old uh, I won of course because I'm merciless but uh, uh, this is uh, Actually, the fact that a 10-year-old could play a, a sports game with tactics so complex is very, very significant of how the game is streamlined, especially because the game is completely in English and each position player has a special rule. So, making this understand uh, to a kid in a foreign language is a big plus if you manage to do it. Uh, other things that could be said about the game it comes with miniatures it is uh, very uh, compact in design design it is basically a slightly bigger box than your normal sized games i i publish unboxing pictures of on our last and the patreon and uh, it's basically uh, slightly bigger than uh, Waveland, which is I think the standard size box which was used for Ticket to Ride or Settlers of Catan or uh, classic games. So uh, you could uh, buy the pre-painted miniature versions which is uh, not necessary but is, uh, is a good luxury if you don't plan to spend uh, time on it because you have to distinguish between blue team and uh, red team some way and uh, well the, th this is basically it the game uh, oh the game time whenever there is a turnover there is a turn track that you move which is the minute time left min minutes left in a period of the game and uh, you have basically up to eight slots and you move except when you score when you don't wh when the turnover doesn't ca that doesn't cause uh, moving onward the timer so when the timer reaches zero you are basically uh, ended the period or the game depending on the period you are in and this is it i don't know if this uh, conveys how much fun it is but it is very very fun it does yeah. sound really fun, and I, I, I checked and I noticed I do not own a single sports-themed board game. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I was thinking about this uh, uh, because I wanted to sample the exclamation at the start of the of my intervention, like saying "Blood Bowl is the king of sports games." Then I noticed that. Uh, there are a lot of manager sports manager games there is blood bowl team manager which is a good card game there are 11 or, or other games like those which are soccer teams uh, management and there are a lot of good ones about this there are a lot of racing games which is still a sport but it's not like team sports but aside from Blood Bowl, I, I really struggle to find uh, a relevant, a famous game uh, I know of uh, Italian adaptation of Blood Bowl to play football, for instance, but I, I don't know of famous games uh, like this. So, I promised a comparison to Blood Bowl, uh, which is my favorite sports game, and in my opinion it's... Uh, the king of sports games and here it is first the rules uh, it's incredibly simple to play trick shot 
I think that the feeling of Blood Bowl is perfectly one-to-one -one conveyed in a way much simpler game without any kind of rule doubt. I played, I think, uh, I played 10 games before I got the game because this was a Kickstarter. I didn't back the Kickstarter, so since World the Senior games are usually very, very limited, uh, I thought that there was no chance of getting it. Uh, they put the Kickstarter leftovers, the overproduction on their website. At this, in this specific moment, there is still availability of both versions. And uh, I managed to get it, to, to get one copy. And uh, this is uh, uh, this is it. Basically, the game is extremely, extremely streamlined. And whatever rule doubt you might have in the game, there is a picture depicting exactly it in the rule book. The rule book is 16 pages with a lot of pictures. It's very, very simple for a game like this. And uh, excluding the first page, which is the cover, and the last page, which is uh, the uh, recap, the, the, the cheat sheet, you basically have 14 pages where every rule doubt are cleared. You have everything clear. I think it never happened to me to get uh, to 14 or 15 plays of a two hour game without having any doubt, without ever getting to the forums to, to ask for something. This is the first game uh, where this happened to me. There are a lot of very, very good rule books. I think that mind management is one of the best uh, uh, in the movement games with clear rules, but still this is the only one game where I played this much without getting into a rule doubt. So, uh, kudos to them for this. And uh, compared to Blood Bowl, the, 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 of course, the, the one-off game, I would probably recommend you to play uh, Trick Shot. Because it's faster, it's simpler, and you can uh, play a rematch very fast. The real difference with uh, uh, Blood Bowl is that Blood Bowl is still king in league play and in uh, simply scope, because Blood Bowl has the, the perfect league system. I think nothing uh, is... I think a uh, league game is half the fun in Blood Bowl because you can... Uh, give experience to your players, you can buy new players, you can give them skills and uh, improve the team, get rerolls and stuff. This is unparalleled in any sports game. Uh, Trickshot doesn't even, doesn't even try to equate this. Uh, there is basically no league rules. You can just play matches in succession. But... And of course, in Blood Bowl, you have like uh, I think uh, 22 teams is the actual roster. I, I didn't, I, I lost track with the new editions. Uh, Blood Bowl is far more complex and it's still a special game to me. The, 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 the anecdotes you have uh, for Game of Thrones, I have for Blood Bowl. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there are teams, there are friends. These are stories like adventures you had in real life. In the end, they end up like good role-playing game sessions mm -hmm. when you still remember. Oh, remember that time when your when your character entered the tavern and said the thing and caused the brawl and stuff like that. These games are stuff of legend, and I think that Wild Trick Shot is a better one-off and not uh, not near the greatness this game reach in campaign play basically i think it's uh, a, a big achievement that the game manages to get that close being so simple so fast and uh, so modern in a way so this is it that's trick shot a recommendation of mine um Quick question. Um, 
like yeah with these um like team cards and one so you can customize your team uh you can you can there are i think 36 i don't remember the number i think 72 player cards and 36 you have basically for each position you have five adjectives and there are team cards which give you a set of adjectives which uh, make up your team you will still have two wingmen two defense mm -hmm. one center and one goalie but their special powers will change with the team card the okay. team cards are pre-made so you can pick or draw but those are the team cards okay so there is some yeah. customization there is possible. a bit of customization there is no full customization mm -hmm. Uh, it is cool because uh, some combinations lead you to specific uh, strategies, but of course you are not forced. Oh, one thing I forgot, these powers are actually all the, 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 the key to distinguish between an, an expert player and, uh, and a rookie. For instance, the, the, the most basic way to play this game doesn't take in consideration sides of players so the fights are resolved exclusively with dice and uh, the speed so everyone moves the same uh, when you uh, so you can play without powers at all and have a fast quick game which is still fun this is the most basic way to play with kids for instance when you start adding powers you will begin to rely on them because the, those are safe actions or they are extremely safe modifiers. So when everything depends on your next roll, you try not to roll. And this is uh, the key concept of look mitigation, which is extremely powerful. I think that that's what makes uh, a Kingdom Death monster player a good player, knowing when to risk. Mm. So... Uh, there are entire genres of game like this. Blood Bowl, again, I think is king in this sector, but Trickshot is a nice introduction which plays still fun and with a lot less frustration. Because oh, another thing to say, another good thing to say about this game is that the frustration, even if you roll dice to get action executed and you will eventually fail every turn, uh, the frustration is reduced to a minimum because the way you play and the way you move actually uh, make you always informed about the risk you're taking and that's very good i think i i i'm, I'm not saying i will buy it i i try not <laughs> to buy more games but oh um, it's on tabletop yeah we can have a game anyway <laughs> yeah. um if I would decide, hey, I, I need a, a sports game in my collection, I'd definitely pick this one over Blood Bowl for one important reason. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't I, have I, to assemble miniatures. Yeah. I can get the pre-painted version. I don't have to paint miniatures. And <laughs> even then, it's cheaper than Blood Bowl. Yeah. Uh, of course, the quality is uh, not comparable. Uh, Games Workshop is a miniature company, and yes, the like if, if, you if get, you're if, yeah. in in for it, in for the, the the hobby aspect, of course, Blood Bowl is, is uh, you know dif different league. But um, for me, uh, if if I feel the need to assemble and paint miniatures, I have a lot of Star Wars tabletop miniatures. I could spend my time on, so uh, that's not something I'm looking for. So uh, for me, Trick yeah, Shot no. seems way more. Uh, enjoyable <laughs> approachable yes uh, as a 42 old man now uh, I have to uh, to say a thing that probably would make young me cringe which is get this instead of Blood Bowl because uh, to play Blood Bowl fully you need a lot of people I think six people is the least to have a satisfying league. And you need league play, which means you are a college student, basically. <laughs> and that that's the way I most successfully play it as a board game. After that, I always play the video game. And there's a Blood Bowl video game, which is a lot of fun and that you can still play. And it settles, basically, the league play for you. 
and uh, there's multiplayer online and it's beautiful and uh, in uh, the video game everything is always painted so <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have to read a 130 yeah, page rule book i i i am afraid uh, i'm afraid that uh, the video game is uh, a good medium for 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 Blood Bowl, exactly like it's for Warhammer Underworlds games, which are pretty good and underestimated games in uh, the Warhammer scene. But if you want to play a board game, you can play this in less than an hour if you want. So there's really no comparison. If if I take this out after dinner with friends there is a chance to play it oh there's also another small 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 thing but it's beautiful uh, you could technically play this with more than than two players because there are two teams but there is a, a very simple rule which is uh, you can play with more in a, in the same team and you alternate player activation within the same turn but while you are activating players you can talk so it's like you are that player in that moment and since you cannot activate the same player consecutively two times it works because you have to understand when you want to make a pass for instance and you have to get in position or the, your friend must uh, understand that you are going to get the ball passed and uh, it it must uh, move the move the player accordingly or get it free because um, there are a, a series of rules I I skipped which make this very lively and it works. The only thing is uh, if you are playing in multiple players, while well, you you could play for instance in three with the two on a team and one on the other team. Uh, of course it's harder to play with two people not talking to each other so uh, try to have balanced teams hmm. and I think that's it yeah I think so. we did like more than an hour episode with two games two people <laughs> <laughs> incredible okay uh, that's what we all the time we have for today and this was the last and you can catch us up on patreon and uh, patreon.com forward slash the last and or you can get uh, say as I on discord you can find the link on uh, uh, the patreon page we don't have an X account anymore since uh, we, are, we are a bad bunch of nasty people of curmudgeons and stuff like this we are grognards and stuff like that and so uh, this was it uh, and for today we were the last D and remember the second D stands for uh, I didn't prepare it so but this um. would be expansions <laughs> it really doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> expectations expectation yeah you had a big <laughs> expectation of this so uh, i hope alexis is uh, is editing this uh, because it, it would be fun to edit yeah <laughs> okay this is it thanks <laughs> <laughs>